and we're live. Welcome to the next day of quarantine. We're super happy to have you here. I asked when we when we first got on on YouTube, I asked in the chat, where are people watching from? And it's amazing to see all these responses come in. Welcome from South Carolina, Layton, Utah, Birmingham, from Central Texas, from Georgia. We're seeing people from all over the United States and I'm super happy to have you here. Welcome from Illinois. So I saw New York in there. Maryland, Sparks, Nevada, Wisconsin, Canada, Bellingham, Washington, Harrison from England. Welcome. Another from Canada, <laughs> Michigan, Texas. Fort Worth, Texas, Oregon, Chicago, Portland, San Francisco, Tennessee, Florida, Iowa, Massachusetts, Canada, <laughs> Colorado Springs, Ohio, Texas, Maryland, Vancouver, Washington. It's so exciting to have you here with us. Thank you for joining us again. And if you are watching the replay afterwards, welcome. We're so glad that you can be here. And today we're going to be learning all about the scientific method. So if you are new to quarantine, let me show you just really quickly. We have a format that we've been following this week where we start off with a science demonstration, a lesson. And then we have a fun little fact or fiction challenge where we'll go through four facts and say whether they're true or not. Um, then there is a engineering challenge, some sort of craft that we do that you are welcome to do at home afterwards as well. We have a math lesson and then what's in the bag and then a drawing prompt. And we have just loved seeing the, drawing, the drawings that you guys have been doing and posting online. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I will say if you want to print out a little worksheet that goes along here. It has the what's in the bag clues and it has the fact or fiction things so that you can look those up in advance. And it also will will have a little bit about the math lesson and our science lesson. It's always fun to watch Science Mom do an intro. Sometimes we would record a Math Dad versus Science Mom video <laughs> and she would get all nervous and she would introduce, she would say, I'm Math Dad and this is Science Mom. And oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I, I do that a lot. Somehow I'm a little better on live TV than I am when I'm just in front of the camera. <laughs> I'm not sure why that would be, but... <laughs> she rises to the occasion. There we go. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about the scientific method, because today, if you um, looked up our, our notes on Patreon, you saw that today we're going to be doing Mentos and Soda, which is really quite exciting, and it's a fun thing. But I have a, a couple of books that have science activities that you can do at home or science activities for kids. And in a couple of those published books, they say Mentos plus soda makes that fountain of bubbles because it's a chemical reaction. Hmm. And if you Googled why do Mentos and soda work a couple of years ago, you would have come up with really conflicting information. If you Google it now, the information's a little bit better and you'll be led to the right conclusion a little more easily. But a few wow. years ago, Say that again. What happens with Mentos and soda? Oh, what happens with Mentos and soda? In case you're not aware, we're going to go outside and you'll find out in just a minute. But if you drop Mentos candies into a bottle of soda, all of a sudden, there's this big fountain of soda that shoots up out of the bottle. And the question we're investigating is why? Why does that happen? And like I said, if you are were Googling this a few years ago, like I was, so about four years ago when I first heard of Mentos and soda, I thought, wow, I want to know why that works. And so I Googled it and I came up with two answers that were opposite. One said it's a chemical reaction. The sugar in the Mentos is reacting with something in the soda to produce gas, to produce bubbles, and that's what makes that fountain go up. And then the other one said, no, no, it's not a chemical reaction at all. It's a physical reaction. So you have dissolved gas in the soda and that dissolved gas, when you add the Mentos in, all of a sudden comes out of solution and makes that big fountain of bubbles. Now, if you came up with these two ideas, and obviously like one of them has to be right and one of them has to be not right because they're kind of giving opposite explanations for this thing. How would you figure out which is right? And you can do it by setting up an experiment. And that's what we're going to do today. We're gonna take this outside to the front of our house and we're going to set up Mentos and several bottles of Diet Coke and the reason we're using Coke is because it actually is slightly more carbonated than other sodas. It has a little bit more dissolved gas, so it typically gives a better reaction. But if you want to try this soda experiment at home, you can use any type of soda. Just Coke will give you the highest tower. And now <clears throat> here's how we're going to test it. 
because if it works because it's a chemical reaction and all you need is sugar for this reaction to happen, then jelly beans should also work. We should see a similar fountain from jelly beans. But if it is a physical reaction and all you need is a rough surface, then sand should work really well. If we just dump sand in the soda, we should see a big fountain. So we're going to go outside and test that. But before we do, I wanna point out real quick that there's another thing that we're gonna circle back to with the scientific method in our fact or fiction. So fact or fiction number four is apples, potatoes, and onions have the same taste. To test this, eat them with your nose closed. And if you plug your nose and can't smell, this fact or fiction says that apples, onions, and potatoes will taste the same. And I gotta say, I think that's 100% false. It sounds unlikely, doesn't it? Yes. But how are we going to figure it out? Scientific method. We're going to test it. I'll tell you, there are dozens of websites that claim that this is true. And I'm skeptical. It just doesn't sound plausible to me. I'm skeptical, too. So we're going to do we're going to do a blind taste test when we get to the fact or fiction and find out if I can tell the difference between onion, potato, and apple. So if you happen to have some of those items at home and want to try this in advance, uh, by all means, that's, yeah, you can, you <laughs> I'm can, very curious. You can join me in the unpleasantness of eating onions <laughs> without right. them being cooked. All right, our, before we, we head outside, I'm not one, this is our first time trying to live stream outside, and I hope it will work well, but because we'll be outside and there's a street where cars can drive by, the quality of the audio might not be as well, so apologies in advance if that's the case. We will not do as much talking outside. We're just gonna do our, our Mentos one after the other. And then when we come back into the whiteboard, we'll talk about why we saw what we saw. But you look like you're gonna say something. Um, no, I'm ready to You're ready to go? Okay, I, I want to show, while we're, while we're walking outside, we're gonna share some of the fantastic results we saw with our engineering challenge yesterday. So Math Dad and I, we built boats that held little Scrabble tiles and they sank after, mine, mine held 10 tiles, woo woo. But Math Dad didn't even hold that many. They sank pretty fast. Yeah, mine was sinking you guys, the tiles. <laughs> holy cow. You guys, the stuff that you were able to float in your Lego boats was amazing. Check out some of the things we saw here. So Cole had 140 pennies. He built edge, um, Legos around the edges so that there would be like a pontoon underneath that would hold air. And then that's the pennies on the on the right side after they all fell into the into the bathtub. And then here we had some a great little boat made out of cups and styrofoams, because you don't just have to use Legos. Check out that those huge Lego box and how many coins they held. And then um, 53 pennies. And I loved this one here. They didn't have coins, but that didn't hold them back. Here's a cup and a water bottle that's cut off and then just a whole bunch of random objects. And that's a lot of weight, way more than what we came up with. So way to go. We loved seeing the pictures of these engineering challenges and all the fun you guys had building boats. That was awesome. Yeah, now they're just showing off. They're trying to take that math, dad. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of trash talking going on. All right. Now we're going to show you one more favorite picture of the engineering challenge, and then it's going to be like magic because the next time you see us, we'll have like run outside with our laptop and we're crossing our fingers really hard that the connection stays good. Here we go. All right. While we're on our way out, I wanted to tell you guys a story of one of my first. <laughs> My, my first uh, experiences with a scientific quandary. When I was little, I grew up kind of working on my grandpa's farm, and my, my dad and grandpa would work there too. And one thing I noticed was that when I was working outside with my dad, he'd be driving the tractor, and a tractor is just noisy and loud. And what would happen sometimes is he would be on the tractor and he'd call out to me, Hey, Serge, go do this. Go, go feed those cows over there or, or, or something. And it would be loud, but, but I would be able to hear him. But then I would shout back to him, and he couldn't hear me. And then I, I knew my dad had pretty good ears, and normally that wasn't a problem. And I couldn't figure it out. We were both yelling equally loudly, but somehow I was able to hear him, and he wasn't able to hear me. Does anybody have a theory for what could be causing that?
All right. Oh, I'm getting requests for my song. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. Oh, come on. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long. But I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> That's going to be in my head all day. All day long. Okay, I want to check in the chat really quick and just ask, can you hear us? And is, can you see the video okay? Is the quality still all right? Give me just a quick yes if you can still hear us and the quality is okay. Good, good, good. Mm. Oh no, oh, someone's saying it's frozen. Hopefully, hopefully it'll continue. Okay. Good to go? Yes. All right, so, so I'm seeing some answers there to my question. So about this tractor, and I think you guys are coming up with the same conclusion. You know we might want to talk about it later, just because the car is going by. All I right. think it's going to be hard. All to right, hear. Well, we'll talk about it when we get back in. Let's. Okay, Mentos and soda. Here we go. Okay. So right now we have a, a bottle of Coca-Cola. This one has been in the fridge for. Yeah, so this one was in the fridge for about 90 minutes this morning. So it's a little bit cooler at temperature than the other bottles. Uh, at the store, there weren't a lot of options to choose from. All right, Mentos in and... Okay, that fountain went maybe a couple of feet high, but not, not, not nothing too amazing. All right, this next one is at room temperature. Which is colder than normal here in Nevada because the weather's been cold. Say that again because I don't think Yeah, yeah, it, it was a little colder this morning. We we also forgot to turn our heat on last night. But we, all right, so the, we've got these Mentos on a string so that we can get them all in at once. Oh, I would say that one may have gone up to three feet high. So. Room temperature seems to have outperformed the cold one. And was this one? This one's in the water. Okay, so this, this one we warmed up. Heated up some water this morning and it soaked for a little while. Let's see if we get it. Oh, that one went up about seven feet. So definitely the record holder. With room temperature again, we're going to do jelly beans. Okay, jelly beans with room temperature. So I've got to ask, Jenny, are your feet going to be sticky? Yes, I'll take my shoes off and go back. Oh, yeah. Sticky feet. Did someone in the chat say that, or is that just a search? No, that's just me thinking that I don't want our uh, <laughs> carpet to get all sticky. All right, so here is room temperature jelly beans. Okay, room temperature jelly beans, and what? The sugar didn't do anything. Well, that's perhaps a little bit surprising. All right, so I'm, get, I'm getting a request to move in a little closer. Uh, can't actually zoom, but I can move my cart closer. All right, what's... Okay, we're gonna try sand. Okay. Room temperature soda with sand. So the, the theory here is that the rough sand will cause the reaction. And, okay, that went about two feet high. Definitely way better than the jelly beans. I would rank that below the Mentos. All right. And now we're gonna do the warm one. All right, now, now we're moving on to the warm soda. With sand. We'll see how this does. Definitely feels a little bit wasteful, but it's it's all in the name of science. Oh, uh -huh. so I'd say that one went about five feet high. Better. Yeah. And then okay, got a couple small bottles here. You're gonna. I'll come a little bit closer and I'll hold this one. So if you want to try 
doing this at home, you don't necessarily need to go and buy a whole bunch of two liter bottles because a small bottle will give you a comparatively good reaction as well. And uh, I'd be surprised if four Mentos is needed for a small bottle. We've got them on the strings just so that it's easy to put them in because if you accidentally drop one, the reaction will start. All right, there you go. Moving back in? Yep, yep, we're gonna move back in. Um, All right. So, kind of fun. Definitely not anywhere near the record highs I've seen with Mentos before, but. So, my glasses are the type that will tint when they get in the sunlight, and often that's a good thing. But sometimes it's kind of annoying because if you come indoors and I've got to wait five minutes before they, they lighten again, but, but do I look pretty cool? <laughs> All right. Let's, let's answer some questions and then talk about it. So one question I saw was, can you drink the sand afterwards? Yes. Can you drink the sand afterwards? I can't believe I said that. Can you drink the <laughs> soda afterwards? And what I was going to say is, Yes, but the one that has sand in it, I would definitely let the sand settle or maybe not drink that one. But the one with the Mentos in it, you can certainly drink and it's not gonna taste that much different, but it will be a little bit less carbonated. Now I'm gonna turn around to the whiteboard because I want to draw a quick little picture and just kind of talk about why this works because the science behind it is pretty cool. So if you look at soda, what you have is a bunch of dissolved gas. When in the first lesson that we did, we talked about dry ice and how carbonation, carbonation sounds kind of like carbon dioxide because that's the gas that we're putting in soda. And when you have carbon dioxide dissolved, you've got these little particles of CO2 that are existing in the liquid in a dissolved state. So they're mixed in with the water, but they would prefer to be a gas. But with the pressure that is on the bottle, they're dissolved in the liquid. And once they come, once you undo that, that lid and open up a bottle of soda, you'll notice that the bubbles always are forming along the outside of the bottle. And if you pour it into a cup, you'll see the same thing, that you get bubbles forming around the outside of the cup, but not just spontaneously inside the, the cup. It's always gonna be around the ice cubes or around the rim of the cup. And that's because these bubbles to come out of solution, to not be dissolved anymore, these little molecules of carbon dioxide, they need a, a site to bind to. They need something to get it started. And that can be just bumping into each other. If you have two little molecules of CO2 that bump into each other, then they'll be like, oh, we can start this process of forming a bubble. And that's why shaking soda will cause it to really erupt when you open it because you've bumped all of these little molecules of CO2 into each other and they've started that process of forming bubbles. But instead of just bumping into each other, a rough surface will do the same thing. And Mentos candies, although they look smooth to us, if you were to look, if you look at them under a microscope, they are actually incredibly rough. The surface has all of these indentations and little caves and holes and that rough surface provides a lot of sites for bubbles to form. Sand is the same way, and sand provides some really good sites for bubbles to form as well. And so when you put a Mentos or sand or salt into soda, then all of that rough surface provides a site for the bubbles to form, and that's what gets that eruption. Can you drink the Coke when it is actually erupting and going up? Uh, that would be really messy. I suppose you could try, but it would kind of be like, I don't know if you ever, like in, in elementary schools when there are drinking fountains in a line, if one person is drinking and another person is, and then they stop, all of a sudden the water pressure increases at the other one, you could like squirt people in the nose. I don't know if you ever did that when you were a kid, but I thought that was pretty funny. It would be like that only times 10. Oh, this is a good question. What would happen if you put the Mentos in and then put the cap back on? You can find, I don't recommend doing that at all. You can find videos on YouTube where people will tape the Mentos up inside the lid, screw it on, and then put the bottle on its side, and the bottle will explode. And when bottles that contain soda explode, it can be pretty dangerous because they're designed to hold a carbonated beverage. 
And the carbonated beverage, because it has gas in it, is under a quite a bit of pressure. So they can hold a lot of pressure. I think they have to get up to oh, like 40 or 50 PSI before they break. And that's that's a lot of pressure. That's We're talking like bike tire range pressure. So you, it's not a good idea to put the lid on. Um, I saw a question, will it work with any type of carbonated drink? It will, but how high you the fountain goes depends on several things. One is the temperature. You guys saw that our soda that was in the fridge, so here's cold, gave a fountain that was that was not very high. The warm or room temperature one went higher, and then our one that was in the hot water bath that was quite warm went the tallest. So the warmer your soda is, the higher your fountain will go. But then the other big thing is how much carbonation there is to begin with. Coca-Cola has, and it doesn't matter if it's diet or not, but Coca-Cola has more carbonation, just a little bit more than the other sodas. So that's why people usually use Coke for this, but most, most sodas will work just fine. What about diet sodas? Um, Mythbusters did an episode on Mentos Plus Soda, and they, they tested a whole bunch of sodas, and they said that the diet soda went just a little bit higher than the non-diet soda. I'm not sure why that would be. They weren't sure why that would be either, but possibly diet soda could work just a little bit better. I saw a question, could you put dry ice in it? You definitely could put dry ice in soda, but it would not do very much to increase the carbonation because you would already have gas being released. Does the Mentos dissolve? The Mentos, the outer layer of the Mentos um, does get softer and sort of um, it starts to dissolve, but it takes a long time for Mentos to, to dissolve. When we go out and clean these up in two hours, um, our Mentos will still be visible at the bottom, but they'll be about half the size they were before. Why didn't the jelly beans work? Why didn't the jelly beans work? Great question. So here's our Mentos. And to us, the Mentos and the little jelly bean, they look about the same in terms of smoothness, but if you look at them under a microscope, this one has a very rough texture and our jelly bean does not. The jelly bean is actually very smooth. And because of that, it doesn't provide those little sites for bubbles to form. Okay, what if you pour the soda in a cup instead of a bottle? Will it still work? It, you will still get more bubbles, but because the cup has a wide opening, instead of funneling it to a smaller opening, you will get something that is more like this, where it'll kind of like fizz over but it's not going to go up because you don't have that narrowing that that gives more pressure. Good question. I want. I saw someone ask, could you use just juice, like orange juice, only if it's carbonated? This only works with carbonated beverages. What would happen with Mentos and dry ice? Not not much. If you had dry ice in some water and then you dropped Mentos in it, there would not be much reaction at all because although the dry ice is making carbonic acid. Remember we talked about that's the main flavoring in soda. The dry ice, it takes it quite a while to actually carbonate water. And if you want to make homemade root beer or something like that by putting dry ice into a container of water and adding root beer flavoring and sugar, you have to let it sit for a couple hours. You have to let it sit for a long time before it actually gets carbonated. So if you drop Mentos into water that has dry ice, the Mentos is gonna get cold and that's about it. There's not gonna be, not gonna be any thing happening. Will any other candies work? Um, sour candies work better than just regular candies. So if you do like sour gummy bears, because they have a rough surface with all of that um, sugar and the little malic acid, the sour material on the outside, they work a little bit better, but not as well as Mentos. I've tried many different types of candies and I have a YouTube video called Why Do Mentos and Soda React? And in that one, we tried several other ones as well. And I've never seen any candy give a fountain as high as the Mentos one does. So good question. Oh, what if you use, could you use sparkling water? You definitely could. Any type of carbonated water will work, but most sparkling water is not as highly carbonated as Coca-Cola. It all depends on how much dissolved gas there is. What if you put a Mentos in your mouth and then drink Coke? Good question. What if you put a Mentos in your mouth and then drink the Coke? When you drink a carbonated beverage, as soon as you put it in your mouth, you'll you'll feel the fizz. 
And with a Mentos in your mouth, I think you would feel even a bit more fizz. But you know what? I'm going to ask Math Dad to go out because we have a couple extra of those small bottles. Yeah. Let's go out right now and we'll try that. Will, will you will, not take the computer out? Will you just go grab two of the bottles of Mentos? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll or, be back in a moment. I have Mentos in my pocket. <laughs> you go get two two little containers of the Coke and we'll we'll give it a try. Can dirt work? It definitely can. The sand that we used is a little bit better um, just because it falls more easily. But as long as your dirt is dry and it will fall it quickly down into the container, then it will work. Salt works really well too. So if you don't have any sand handy, you can use salt, any type of salt or rock salt. And because those crystals are fairly rough, then that will work as well. What happens if you use baking powder? This is an outstanding question because if you use baking powder or baking soda, you are actually then getting both a physical reaction and a chemical reaction because soda is a little bit more on the on the acidic side of the pH scale. It's you know similar to lemon juice or vinegar, soda is acidic. And if you add baking soda to soda, even if that soda is completely flat and not carbonated at all, you will get a chemical reaction. You will have baking soda plus the pop, you know, your Coke or whatever else it is, produce carbon dioxide gas because of a chemical reaction. But the baking soda particles are, you know, when you, when you dump that powder in, those clumps of baking soda are rough enough that they also help just the carbonation that is in the soda come out and so you get both a physical reaction and a chemical reaction. And baking soda works really pretty well. Okay. Oh, great question here. What if you make the jelly rough? So like if you took sandpaper and sanded all the edges of the jelly beans, I bet they would work a lot better. Whether they would work as well as the Mentos, I don't know. I've never tried it. And now I'm gonna have Math Dad come over. Actually, let's just turn around. Okay. Now, uh, I actually don't know that I would recommend you guys trying this because of the choking hazard. Yes, please be careful. We are gonna do small sips. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna be very careful about this because yeah, it, it could go very poorly. Uh, You're making me nervous now. I'm like, no, this is hardly gonna do anything. But now I'm like, oh, maybe it's gonna be worse than I thought. Right, well, but, <laughs> but if it just, if it washed it down your throat, that's a choking hazard's gonna be worse than any carbonation coming out of your mouth. Okay. So I, I think first we should just take a small, small little sip of soda. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. So we we don't ever buy soda. We don't drink soda. And every time I have something carbonated, I'm like, why would people do this to themselves? <laughs> it's, yeah. Okay. We, and then now we will not be getting any Coca-Cola sponsorships anytime soon. No, no. <laughs> Um, I've got a bottle here for you just in case you need to spit it out. One for me, too. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so Mentos candy really fast. All right. Okay. So, oh, bravo. <laughs> Fizzed up lots of bubbles in my mouth, but there wasn't a lot of pressure to it. Yeah, there were definitely more bubbles. Um, yeah, so I was, I was expecting... So something bigger or worse, but also we did, you see we didn't actually drink very much. No. Now that I've sucked on it for a second, I'm going to try again. So not as much. Yeah, not not, not as much. It's already getting smoother. So I don't know if you guys have seen online. I saw someone post a picture of a bunch of Mentos in frozen ice cubes, and said like best prank ever. You put Mentos in ice cubes since they're white, people can't see them. And then they put ice cubes in their soda. And 10 minutes later, all of a sudden their soda explodes. And from what we've just talked about, you probably can already be telling me that is not going to work at all. If you put Mentos in ice cubes and then put it in soda, it's just going to make the it's just going to make the soda a little bit more sweet once that ice cube melts. But by the time the ice cube starts to melt, that rough surface of the Mentos will have dissolved like as it was freezing in the ice cube and then as the ice cube is melting. I'm sure you're not gonna get any type of reaction at all. All right, what about a Mentos and a Warhead? Or people could, yeah, try what a about Warhead, a, yeah, I don't know. What about a Mentos and a Warhead? I've never tried Warheads, but they, warhead, yeah. yeah, they strike me, Warheads strike me as having a fairly rough surface and they've got kind of that powder on it. So 
that might be a candy that would work rather well. Will salt water work? That's a good question. No, salt water does not have dissolved gas in it, not enough dissolved gas to actually come out of solution like, like a carbonated beverage does. You have to have something that is carbonated and that is under pressure that has a lot of extra gas in it. Good question. Now, I want to share with you guys a little mystery relating to the, the Mentos. Now, I tried, I tried sharing my screen earlier. We still haven't worked out how to share screens, but I'm gonna post um, the, this video that I referenced. I'm gonna post it on Patreon so you guys can see because it's really kind of amazing. Mentos versus Mentos and soda always for me has had at least four to five feet of uh, eruption happen and sometimes a lot higher. But when I went to Texas recently to do a project with a school there, they said, oh, we tried Mentos and soda and it was really underwhelming. It didn't work. You know, we only came a few inches. And I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. You must have just not known what you were doing. And so we got some Mentos and soda and tried it. And sure enough, in Texas, the highest reaction we got was about three inches tall. And then I came back home to where I live in Nevada and tried it again. And if my fridge, if my soda was cold, like I'd put it in the fridge, I would get maybe about eight inches. But when my soda was warm, it went it went up to the roof. And so I'm I'm curious to know if you do try this, what kind of results you get. The only thing that I can figure is that maybe if the soda has a, a rough ride from the transportation, the place where it's made to where the store is and it's shaken a lot and then calms down and shaken a lot that maybe that reduces the carbonation. I don't know. The pressure stays the same, but I don't think that would work. Eh, that, it's a mystery to me. And again, I will be posting a little video comparing these two to Patreon. And then I invite you guys to test it out and give inputs because I have, I'm not sure. I have no explanation for this. And this is one of the fun things about science because you think um, the more you study something, sometimes the more mysteries you uncover. And this is a mystery currently that I don't have a good answer for. So the question here, what about Coke and Mentos in a balloon? Coke and Mentos in a balloon um, would be really hard to set up without them touching each other. But if you got a balloon with some Coke in it and had a Mentos in there and they were not touching, and then you were able to drop the Mentos in so that it reacted with the Coke, I bet there would be enough of a reaction to make the balloon pop. I think so. There's, there's yeah. a lot Although, of air coming out. It would all depend on how carbonated the Coke was. Like you'd have to open it up fresh, get quite a bit in the balloon. And again, you can only fit, before a balloon's blown up, you can only fit just you know a few tablespoons in there. This would be really tricky to set up. A good question. We'll just take just a few more questions and then we're gonna go on to our factor fiction. Well, no, we, oh. we, what we, we really didn't talk much about the scientific method throughout all this. We just, we've had so much fun with the Coke and, and Mentos. Can you maybe <laughs> That's elaborate true. on that? And, and I think because I did this other video about the scientific method, I sort of, yes. So we're gonna elaborate on the scientific method just a little bit and then we will do our factor fiction. So let's talk about um, a hypothesis. So if you have the hypothesis or the idea that it is a chemical reaction, that sugar plus the Coke gives you bubbles, then other types of candy should work. And so if this is your hypothesis, and then you try gummy bears and gummy worms and other types of candies and they don't work, that means that your data, your result, does not support this hypothesis. The other idea or the other hypothesis that we were looking at was that it's just a matter of texture. That if you have a rough texture plus Coke, that that is what gives you bubbles. And this one is supported by our data because when we tried sand, we saw fountains that were just about as high as the one with the Mentos. And I will say that the temperature difference also supports this data, this hypothesis about it being dissolved gas. Because when the temperature is higher in the soda and the molecules are moving around more quickly, then those nucleation sites can form and spread a little more, uh, a little faster. So would this, couldn't there be some third reason that we didn't think of? That's a great question. It is, it is true with the scientific method that things, things can often evolve and change as you get new information because it's possible 
that there is more going on here than just these two ideas. There could be a third reason that we haven't yet fully understood. And sometimes in science, you'll see really exciting discoveries where, and you see this, especially if you look at the history of the atom and how we discovered the atom, we started out with one model. And then as we got new information, the model of the atom changed and changed again and changed again. And if you were to ask people, you know, 60 years ago, what are atoms? What are they made of? They would give you very different answers than what you'll get today, which is really kind of an exciting thing that our knowledge is always improving and growing. So if, if I remember right, so when we first started looking at this, we didn't, we hadn't even thought about the temperature mattering. So we, we tried to run the experiment and we came up with our results and said, aha. And then I don't know if someone else pointed it out or if we just figured it out, but we were getting different results on different days. And that, that seemed a little yeah. weird to us. And eventually we realized, oh, the temperature, temperature is huge. Matters. Well, and, and a big part of the reason why we realized temperature was important was because my my highest fountains of soda that we had, I had recorded in July in Nevada when it's ridiculously hot. And then when I went to Texas and we had such small fountains of soda, it was in December and it was fairly cold. It was cool outside. And so that's when I thought, all right, elevation and temperature, I need to test those two things. And we saw that the temperature made a huge difference. Okay, so, so we've been going through our scientific method, we came up with a hypothesis, we came up with some tests, and then we realized, oh, we actually need to improve those tests or at least try other things. And then, so what, what's what's next? What what happens after you've run tests? What what else is part of the process? Um, analyzing your data, looking at your looking at the results, and then deciding if they fit your hypothesis and confirm it or if they don't, and if it's significant. Because sometimes you can have small changes in your data and it doesn't really mean anything. It's just normal, it's just normal. Things are not always the same. The, the height that we got on the soda outside today is different than the height I've seen other times and there's just natural variation. You could get 12 bottles of soda, put Mentos into them all and have them all be the same temperature and you'd have different heights of fountains. Oh. And then, okay, so, so then I've seen a lot of science fairs where people actually make posters and share their results. So it, it seems like after this, we've got to publish. Oh, or and, and share. That's where you were going. I was like, yeah. where is well, you no, trying well, to lead me? Well, that, that's you, you were you were right too. I was kind of skipping a, a step, but um, publish or perish. Publishing is good. Yeah, yeah. So we've got to share our results. If we just do experiments and then don't tell anyone about them, well. That didn't do a lot of good. Yeah. I mean, science is all about helping the world learn new things. And, and there's that great Mythbusters um, quote by the guy who does Mythbusters. So he said, the only difference between messing around and science is writing it down. You write it down, <laughs> write it down, and you're a scientist. Uh -huh. I, I like that one. Um, so we are going to move into our fact or fiction because that has to do with the scientific method as well. But before we do that, I want to take just a quick second to show some of the mazes that we did because we had a Minecraft um, lesson yesterday that was dealing with mazes. And then our drawing prompt was to draw a maze and we had some fantastic entries. So we have a, a rabbit looking for food, Dorothy looking for Toto, I loved these. Yeah. We had some great mazes that used like um, negative space. So, you know, the inside part of the maze was colored and the path was was clear. I thought these were, Fantastic. And then this one made Math Dad laugh so hard. So on the right, we have Cookie Monster trying to get cookies, which cookies. is fabulous. And then this one, <laughs> I am bald, inertia hat. And you have to solve math problems to get through the maze. What does five times 12 equal? 60 or 50. And if you choose the wrong answer, you don't get through the maze. And I thought this, when we saw that one last night, Math Dad was laughing so hard. It was really great. Yeah, that's my type of maze. Yep, yep. <laughs> All right, fact or fiction? All right. We're gonna start off with our taste test. Yeah, okay, so actually I want to ask you guys, um, we, we, for this taste test, we, we are- I can smell the onions already. Okay. Like you haven't even taken the lid off. All right, I want, say, well, close your nose. All right, all right. All right, you keep your eyes open for a moment here, but I'm gonna have you close them as well. But so the, the question was specifically, let me see if I've, well, I don't know. What are you looking for? Oh, to see if I had 
the question here, but never mind. It's just on this page. Apples, potatoes, and onions have the same taste. So that's the fact or fiction. So to test this, eat them with your wait. Your nose closed. Yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, closed. no, no cheating, science. Okay. Mom. All right. My nose is so, closed. So, uh, how would you actually test this hypothesis that you that they have the same flavor? What would you do? Jump back to the comments here. Um. And, I mean, it sounds really far fetched to me because surely they can't possibly taste the same. That sounds far fetched to me too. But what I'm wondering is how long are you going to make me stand here with my nose plugged? You know, <laughs> until you can't smell anymore. That's it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, one way I'm going to test this is by feeding him to Science Mom and seeing if she can tell the difference. But it's going to be important. Uh, plug I, it out. I can't, like, I can't swallow with my nose plugged very well. This oh, is it's, not a, very... it's a rough life, Science Mom. <laughs> Sympathy all right. denied. All right, all right. I'm all right. ready. Okay, eyes closed. My eyes are closed. All right. Open your mouth. Okay, I gotta say two things. First, well, whoa, okay. <laughs> Holy cow. So first I will say, I knew that was an, an onion, <clears throat> but it was amazingly less taste like an onion with my nose closed. Like the first crunch down for a half a second, I thought apple or potato, and then I could tell it was onion, but it wasn't very strong. And then when I unplugged my nose, it was like, <sighs> yeah, but I couldn't swallow very well with my nose plugged. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm really quite impressed. I thought it would be way worse, but it was still unpleasant. Right. Again, eyes closed. <laughs> plug your nose. Okay. I just had the, the toothpick. Potato. Okay, let's see if your guess changes with this next one then. Oh, I got a swallow. All right. Another potato. Oh, how many raw potatoes are gonna make me eat? She got it. Okay, it was a potato. <laughs> Here you go. You can have an apple to. to. No. Fix your taste buds. I'll, I will cover up the onion here so you, you don't done. have to smell it anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to still call that one false because you could definitely still tell that they were apples, onions, or potatoes. But I'm going to say I'm impressed that the taste difference is not bigger. I think we often don't realize how much our sense of smell influences what we taste. And I I was impressed that the onion, I had a half second when I first bit down where I wasn't sure if it was an apple or a potato. Hmm. So Is it safe to eat raw potatoes? I saw that. Oh, is it safe to eat raw potatoes? Yes, as long as they are not green. You do not want to eat potatoes that have started to turn green and they're getting ready to sprout because there is a, a compound when they turn green that's actually mildly poisonous. You'd have to eat a lot of I mean, I think you'd have to eat several green potatoes to get sick, but you would get sick. Um, so if they're green potatoes, make sure you peel off all the part that is green before you eat them. But a raw potato is just fine to eat, but mm -hmm. not as tasty as cooked potatoes. There's actually someone named King Potato saying, don't eat my children. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sorry, King Potato. <laughs> <laughs> Some comments in there saying, Math Dad, you're mean. <laughs> oh, this was fun. All right. <clears throat> Fact or fiction. Snow leopards can leap 50 feet in one jump. 50 feet? 50 feet. Holy Toledo. That's like jumping across our whole house. That's that's yeah. really big. Yeah, um, so that's, that's, that's the distance. It's not 50 feet high, but... Yeah, 50, but 50 yeah, feet okay. long? I'm going to say false. I can't imagine them making a jump that far. It's true. They can. Are you serious? They can seriously jump. to 50 feet, so... Wow. Well, that's like Parshendi level jumping. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's wow. That is some, that's amazing. Some serious jumping. All right, <clears throat> up next, the Great Barrier Reef is Earth's largest living structure. The Great Barrier Reef is Earth's Earth's largest living structure. Can you count it as being one big structure? So I know that the Great Barrier Reef is huge, but I it's all made of individual corals. 
like does it count as being one thing so it's phrased as largest living structure structure and a, like a building as a structure it's made of individual bricks all right i'm gonna say true you're right it's true awesome <clears throat> well done all right fact or fiction one third of earth's population has never made a phone call wow one third of Earth's population has never made a phone call. Okay, so who could we be including in that? We could be including like children under the age of two have probably never made phone calls and they make up some portion of the Earth's population. And then people living in um, third world countries without any electricity or things like that could be included. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna guess true, although I'm surprised I would have no, it's false. It's false? All right. Okay, so, what percentage is it? Okay, so, well, it's actually a pretty small percentage at this point. Um, so if you go back 20 years, then the, I think the stat was as high as 50% of oh, wow. sort of hadn't seen, a, hadn't and ever made, made a phone, a phone call. call. And yeah, but this one's kind of, kind of been debunked now. It's just outdated. But you didn't have to go back too long before it was actually true. Hmm. We, we, we take a lot of this for granted. Tell our kids we grew up and they, there weren't even cell phones and they're like, oh, you must be ancient. At the last school visit I did, I always get really great questions about how I became a scientist and how you discover new things, how you do research. And so I was talking about doing research and looking for answers. And I had a little second grader who raised their hand and said, but have you ever been looking online and got distracted by cat videos? And I thought it was so cute because... Yeah, I, I think we kind of take for granted growing up without the internet, um, just how much more distraction there is there is nowadays. And I said, yes, I have been distracted by cat videos before. No. Um, with the potato thing, there was something that I wanted to mention with, with, with this experiment, and that was this idea of it being a blind experiment. Do you think science mom would have been able to taste the difference if she'd actually looked at the onion and taken a bite? I mean, there's there's no chance she wouldn't have said, oh, that tastes like onion. Um, so yeah. it, it was important that she was blind in that experiment. In this case, she would, it was literally covering, Close, covering her eyes. So, so they call that a blind experiment. And one way to make it an even stronger experiment would be to make it double blind so that the person administering the experiment doesn't know the answer either because then that person can't give hints one way or the other. Yeah, so if Math Dad didn't know what he was picking up, if he had his eyes closed too and he was just picking up a toothpick and had no idea if it was going to be a potato or an uh, apple or an onion, then that would have made it an even, that, that would, then it would have been double blind. And that's an even better way to get data and not have, not have it be um, messed up by bias or things like that. Yeah. Um, earlier, I had told a story about my dad and the tractor. And oh, the, yeah. so when he was on the tractor, he would call out to me, Hey, I can go do this. And I, I would call back to him. I could hear him, but he couldn't hear me. And I, I saw in the comments, a lot of you were, were figuring this out because he was next to the tractor that was putting out so much noise. Well, by the time my sound waves reached him, they were greatly diminished and the tractor was just drowning them out. But when he was calling to me, he was pretty loud. Some of his sound waves were actually making it to me and, and they just weren't competing against the, the tractor's sound waves or the, at least they were on a level playing field. Whereas with me being at, at a distance, I just couldn't compete. And But it was a really neat realization because it, that there was some asymmetry in my situation and my dad's situation that just wasn't obvious to me as a kid. Why can't he hear me? And, All because of that, yeah, that loud background noise. Now, before we go on to our engineering challenge, I want to I want to share another another one of our our maze submissions because we had some some really fun fun ones this time. So, this one help the cat get the fish so he's not hungry. I love the detail and the coloring, and then help the penguin get to the water. I love that it looks like they're drawing the um, the the pathways. Do you see those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you drew math, yesterday. Math maze. Your math maze. And then the coloring on the the one with all the animals. Oh my gosh, so beautiful. I loved this one. And then this rainbow maze here, I thought was wonderful as well. So fantastic artwork, you guys. These were just beautiful. And now I think we're ready for our engineering challenge. It's that time. So we have a theme of mazes going on with the 
math math um, question that we had yesterday. And today for our engineering challenge, we are going to build a marble maze. So for this one, I think you just can raid your recycle bin for materials. Math Dad and I are going to be using two pizza boxes that are the same size. So we've got our pizza boxes here, and then we're gonna use duct tape and popsicle sticks, and those are the only supplies that we're using. But I bet you could come up with an even better marble maze if you use more materials. That's right, and uh, so what the goal is, is we're going to try to build something of, of a ramp, and so we're gonna set this up so that it's angled, and we're going to roll our marbles down it. And we decided that for us, we're going to actually have the goal that uh, we're gonna see whose maze can take the longest. So the, the marble has to travel to the bottom, but we want um, it to take a long time. So yeah, so if, if, if it, I just- Because you could just make a, a shoot and just go straight down, and that would be a little less exciting, but yeah. That's so that, we're gonna go for. So I'm going to try to set my timer here for five minutes. Um, I think we're probably going to need 10 for this, just because... To do a good job? Well, to do any type of job. <laughs> we'll find out. You sound so scared, we, science mom. <laughs> we can... So yeah, we can, we can do five minutes and see where we're at, but we might need a few more minutes. We might need a few more minutes. And I, I have seen a few comments from people um, and I, saying that they they enjoy watching and that when they get to the engineering challenge they'll pause it and then they'll like you know they'll they'll make the engineering challenge whatever it is have lunch and then come back and keep watching which i love and i want to tell you i love i love seeing the comments in the chat and i know that a lot of you stay with us the whole entire time and we love having you here but if it's too long for your child and they need a break the engineering challenge is a great place to pause go build your marble maze and then you can come back and keep watching Clock's ticking. The clock is ticking. And I'm sure in the comments, there are gonna be people asking for the song. And I think maybe you should pick a different song so that I don't have it stuck in my head all day. <laughs> I don't know a different song. You don't know any <laughs> other songs? <laughs> I'm singing a song, I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. <laughs> I think a lot of people now know the words to this song. <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. It's tr 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 truly a mystery. One, one of the questions that I saw when we were talking about um, the apple and onion and potato was, are apple seeds poisonous? And they actually are. And if you think about it from the point of view of the apple tree, the apple tree wants you to eat the fruit because that you know it wants it wants those seeds to be spread. But if you eat the fruit and then you also eat the seeds, um, and they get completely digested, then that's not good for the apple tree because then it doesn't have new apple trees. So it's not very uncommon for seeds that have fruits to have the seeds be not as good or even poisonous, and then the fruit be edible. That's not a super uncommon thing. But yes, you would not want to eat apple seeds. They do contain um, cyanide. And so you could actually, and I mean, you'd have to eat a lot of them to get sick, but it could make you very sick. Well, what about like things that, that taste bad, like, uh, like choke cherries or, or something? So the sure the tree wants those seeds to get eaten, right? Or, yeah, but maybe not by people. Maybe it's trying to attract birds instead. Oh. Yeah, choke cherries taste terrible unless you add a whole bunch of sugar. Gotcha. Yeah, we, we used to go pick choke cherries once a year, and uh, it was just kind of kind of uh, fun little adventure, but. Uh, yeah, we, we dare each other to eat them, and there is a reason that they are named choke cherries. We need a lot of sticks here to make this work. So should we tell the story of how we first met? That might be a fun story to tell, or should mm -hmm. we save that one for tomorrow? What do you okay. think? Um, oh, whoops. 
So <laughs> it was one of those uh, Pied Piper scenarios. Um, I play the violin, and in truth, I don't pull it out very often anymore, but uh, I, I used to be pretty good. And in college, one day in the dorms, I pulled out my violin, and I was playing along, and this girl came in to see who was playing. So I was in the study room, so I kind of felt a little bit naughty, like, I probably shouldn't be He's, playing the violin here. Yeah, th this is surge level rebellion. Practicing the violin in the study room, that's about as that's about as off the rule book as Serge gets. I was a rebel. Yeah, or Math Dad. Some, and I've seen a lot of people asking, like, what are your real names? So Math Dad's real name is Serge. My real name is Jenny. And yep. And I, I think it's rather cute that Math Dad thought he was being pretty rebellious practicing his violin in the study room. Yep. yep. So I knocked on the door, and I was just curious to see, because I couldn't quite tell if it was one violin or two violins, because there were these... Um, yeah, chord, chords happening. Yeah, I was playing on two, two strings at once. And and so I, I just knocked on the door to see because I was curious. And I said hello, asked him how long he'd been playing the violin. And when I asked him what his name was, and he said, Serge, I said, are you serious? It's, it's, it's not, not a very standard name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we had a chemistry class together. And he would fall asleep almost every single lecture. It was, oh, that's your that's alarm. Five minutes, really? Yes, I told you we needed more time. We're well, just going to keep going. It's because you're going so slowly. That, that's, that's what it is. Um. So I, we, had, we had a chemistry class, and we, we sat together, and he would fall asleep almost every single class period. And when he would fall asleep, I would write um, a letter on his hand, and then he would wake up. And most class periods, I could write, help, I'm falling asleep, or help, I can't stay awake. On his on his hand or on his arm, one letter at a time. Because each time I wrote a letter, he'd wake up, and then a few minutes later, he'd start falling asleep again. And I'd write another letter. <sighs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, maybe I was, wasn't the best of students. Just, now, you, now that I'm a professor, uh, <laughs> you, you got a better grade in that chemistry class than I did. Wow. Yeah, go me. That first semester, you, you did you did well. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, we were we were friends, and um, then a couple years later, so we, we just, yeah, we, we kind of stayed friends, stayed in touch, and then a few years later, I was getting ready to leave the country, actually, on a service mission, but then I got cancer, and so I sent Serge an email saying, I'm not going to be going, so don't come to this little farewell party that they were going to have for me, because I got cancer. And that was... Good news for me, because that meant that she was around to date. And, and so Serge said that his first reaction was like, oh, that means we can date. And then he felt really bad that his first reaction to the news that I had cancer was like, Yay. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it was a good type of cancer to have. It was um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, which has a, a really high um, cure rate. And so instead of, instead of receiving the news that I had cancer with, you know, it could be a death sentence, I was told I had cancer and that 96% of people who had the same cancer I had recovering, um, recovered and that I would have six months of chemotherapy and radiation, but then should be just fine after that. Yes, very good news. Yeah, cancer's rough though. So you went through how many cycles of chemo? Um, eight cycles of chemotherapy and then I had uh, two months of radiation and lost, lost all my hair. Um, we, we started, um, we kind of, we emailed every day and, um, then would see each other on, on weekends. Like the highlight of my day every day. Oh, and this was back in the day when email was not so easy. You could, you'd type a big message and then you'd lose the connection and there was no such thing as auto save. Oh, you guys have it so easy now. So then, um, when, when we got engaged, you had more hair than I did. That that is true. I was bald. He had hair when we got engaged, and now the tables have turned. <sighs> yep. I miss my hair. <laughs> but it's probably not coming back. I need, I need to move on. Yeah, you look good, bald. Oh, thanks. Falling behind here. Well, 
I, I think whenever I get to the bottom, that's when the new timer should be done, and we just have to try out our mazes no matter what. Uh, you know, that's not, not unfair. <laughs> since, since we've gone over already. So. so now you guys know the story of how Math Dad met Science Mom. Yeah. I thought she was such a rebel, a girl over in the boys' dormitory. <laughs> yep, so. All right. right. We done? Is that it? I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Are you ready? I, I guess I am. That, that's where we're at. So I would just like to point out that I have superior duct tape skills. Ah, uh, you. Yeah. Because mine, mine looks good. Duct tape's the best. D duct tape, duct tape is the best. All right, so let me show you what I've got here. So I, I went with some really long zigzags here, whereas Science Mom seems to have gone for shorter ones, shorter zigzags. Ooh, but although more. you know what, I didn't realize our marbles were this big. Oh man! Well, it'll be interesting. It, it, it will be. We, we didn't have any tiny marbles. We have these bigger ones from a, a different set. So I'm going to set up the ramp so um. that we're ready to go and. You can set it at any angle you want. Oh, I thought we were both just going to hold ours oh, and no. them at the same time. No, we have to move this down to the floor. It's, it's the only way. Oh, okay. We want it to be a good contest. Math, Math Dad takes his competition seriously. Oh. So he's setting up a pillow on the floor so that we can not be holding our our ramps because if we're holding them, then one of us could like move it up and down and that might compromise the contest. Yeah, we, we can't have that. All right, so our, here's our ramp. Look at my timer here. All right. And you're going to time it? You don't want to just do them at the same time? Well, no, because we, our, our, our ramp's only going to let Kay. one go. Ready? Marks, get set, go. Oh, man. Uh -oh. oh, no. Um, <clears throat> you're not seeing this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, took eight seconds to get to the bottom. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. My, I, I clearly have a few engineering flaws that I need to, yeah, that that, I need to overcome. I, I agree that that one looks a little flat there. All right. Mm. Now it's time for math, step, math dads. All right. And Mark, get set, go. <laughs> oh, man. So clearly our ramp is not steep enough. No, no, good. I think... The steeper ramp, it would probably keep going, but uh, messed it up. Huh, well, How I, many seconds did you get? I don't know. I think we, well, 13 seconds, but <laughs> we, we, since we had to stop, um, hmm, maybe we both lose. But I, okay, the problem was just the ramp. We, did, we didn't set the ramp steep enough. We need a bigger pillow. The fluffy pillows are the problem. The fluffy, so. The, the insufficiently fluffy pillows. Do, should, and then I guess I should ask you guys, should we do, should we do our ramp one more time and set it up steeper? And when you guys make your marble mazes, you can um, post them on social media, or um, so you can do do a video and put them on Instagram, or you can put them on the Facebook post that I'll do right after this finishes. And yeah, share a little video clip, share pictures of your mazes. I'm sure you guys are going to be able to come up with much better creations than what we did, kind of rushing through in ten minutes. Are you ready for round number two? I'm ready for round number two. Okay. All right, we've got our ramp steeper now, and we'll see which which maze is better. All right, so not even gonna bother timing it. I'll just hope that we can get the marbles to the bottom. We declare that to be victory. Not bad, and I like how you've got like the little bumpers here. That's good. That's good design. Yeah, I think that's what was supposed to have happened. Very nice. All right, now my turn. We'll see if I get stuck. I definitely made this one a little too flat. Oh my goodness. What the what? Too steep? So we can make a little no, shallow. No, well, yours was the same. Oh yeah, but I was going to let each person choose what steepness to use. <laughs> All right. I, th I think we know who the, who the winner is. Let, let us know in the comments who you think won this contest, just so it's official. Um, I, I think Math Dad definitely won. But you can you can validate validate his victory in the comments. And then when you're making your own engineering challenge, you can really use anything you want. So your own marble marble drop, just I'd say get the recycling bin and cut out anything you want. And all you really need is a flat surface or an angled surface and then material that the marble can roll down. 
And if you wanted, I mean, you could even use paper and sort of make it like the marble mazes where you could even do tracks. You don't have to stay in sort of a 2D format. You could, you could bring it out and go 3D. Oh, you are definitely getting the votes for winning. Oh. <laughs> he is thrilled. He is thrilled. Because that's what life is all about. Coming out on top. <laughs> that's not what life is all about. Oh, okay. But it's nice when you can win. It is, it is. So good job. I want to share a couple more mazes that you guys sent in um, yesterday that I saw posted on Facebook and Instagram. And then it is time for our math lesson. So we'll drop real quick over here. And you do not have to be limited to pen and paper. We had some great people who did mazes using um, digital programs. And we saw some fantastic Minecraft mazes. But I really loved this butterfly maze. Isn't that pretty? And I loved the colors in the digital drawing, too. And then we've got Pippi Longstocking to go looking for get her gold coins back. And I loved, loved both of these mazes. Yeah, you guys had some great destinations. Yes, the, the destinations game. were great. Help Spot get to his water bowl. Help the scientist get to the chemistry bottles. I loved <laughs> this one. And then our last one before we go to the math challenge, but not least. The mermaid help her get back to her mythical world. I love this one. And then the colors here in this one were fantastic. So keep it up with a great drawing. And I can't wait to see what you guys come up with for tomorrow. We'll do our drawing prompt at the end. But if you go on Facebook and Patreon, it's already posted there. Our drawing prompt for tomorrow is going to be tons of fun. I can't wait to see them. All right, let's move over to the whiteboard now for our math lesson. All right. Always have to scoot it up here. All right, so last time, the challenge that I gave us involved uh, mazes. And it wasn't the type of maze that's hard to solve. It's actually the type that's super easy to solve. But our rule was we, we wanted to only move to the right or upwards. And we wanted to be able to reach our goal. And the real math question, though, was how many different paths would lead to that goal? I don't actually know the question myself, or the answer to the question myself. We're gonna figure that out right here. So, but to do this, I'm gonna mark everywhere where a decision needs to be made. Um, and it's better to have too many circles than, than not enough, even if there's not even really a decision to be made. All right, so this, this one's gonna be big, full of lots of decisions. I'm gonna to try to redraw this and I'm going to connect those points based off of whether you can travel from one dot to another. So circle, 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 circle. And then the last one there. Oh, yeah. So I've got to draw my arrows here. Long problem just to set it up. We've got to set it up right. Otherwise, we can't solve it. Those two could connect. And we had several people um, send in their answers, and and I think several of them were right. I actually haven't done done it yet to try and figure it out. So I'm curious. I'll be curious to see when Math Dad tells us the answer. But a lot of you guys worked on this yesterday, and it was really cool to see those answers come in. Um, I think I've got it all. Now the question is, can you see it? All right. So I'm going to start here in the bottom left. There's one way to reach this dot, and then that means there's only one way to get to here, one way to get to here, and I'm just looking at these arrows. So all the arrows that come into a circle, I'm just adding the numbers that came before it. So just one way to get to there, all right? And actually along the bottom edge, it's just going to be a one, a one, and a one, because I can only travel to the right. All right, here there's only one way to get to this one, and finally, now, when I get to this circle, there's a one and a one. I'm gonna put a two there. All right, here's just a one. Now that makes this one a two because there was a one and a one coming in. Ooh, one plus two is 
three. Three plus one is four for this guy. Two plus three is five. One plus two is three. Right. Three plus five is eight. Four plus five is nine. All right, one plus eight is nine. And then nine plus nine is 18. So many people were right. 18 was the most common answer we were getting in our in our messages. Good job. This was, this was not an easy problem. I, I don't know what why I thought that I should just give this to a bunch of kids, and, but uh, apparently you guys can do this. It's this because you stuff. love combinatorics. I, I do love combinatorics questions. Uh, just e easy to go a little bit. Real, a little bit too deep, but yeah, they, they, these these are fun questions. And actually, to show you that they're not easy questions, uh, let me just point out. Somebody wrote in and said, "Math Dad, you got it wrong. You you, you did your example wrong." So I I had drawn up a little graph, and what I said was, "You can just make any type of structure." And so there were three circles here, two circles here. One circle at the end, and then we said you could go this way, this way, this way, down, you could go down, and I filled this guy out for us yesterday, and I messed up. It didn't work. My solution was wrong. All right, so starting here, trying to end up all the way over in this rightmost square, and in order to get there. Well, there's only one way to get to this one, but now this circle has two arrows coming in, so we have to use both arrows. One plus one is two. This one has just two arrows coming in. One plus two is three. All right. This one up here only has one arrow coming in, so one. All right, but now when I get hit, this is where I messed up last time. I said there were three arrows coming in here, and I added up these three, but guess what? There were not three arrows. There are one, two, three, four arrows. So I needed to add up all four of those. One plus one plus two plus three is seven. And now there are two ways to get to the end. The answer should have been eight, but I only wrote seven. So thank you for writing in to correct me. I, I really do love it when uh, people call me on these things. Like, don't just take my word for it. Try it. See if it actually works. Yeah. There's, there's no better way to, to learn it than to try it yourself, maybe to teach someone else how so it works. I, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it was someone's dad who, who did that little solution, and then they took a picture and sent it in. So yay for another math dad. <laughs> Indeed. All right. I really like the, the mazes that you guys came up with. This has been fun. All right, today I wanted to talk about the, the 12 days of Minecraft, is what I was gonna call this problem. Uh, you guys know the song, the, the 12 days of Christmas? It was not exactly Christmas time, but- You should sing the first part of it. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me a partridge in a pear tree. So that was the first day, but on the, the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. And when Math Dad first told me about this idea for the problem, I was like, no, no, no. It's just you get one gift the first day, two gifts the second day. And I had no idea. Like, and then I thought about it, and I was like, no, he's right. Yeah. You, get, you actually get 12 pear trees and 12 partridges. That's a lot of pear trees. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so let's, let's, let's see what Science Mom is talking about here. So on the first day of Christmas, there was just one gift. So let me write this. So on day number one, there was one the number of gifts. So one gift on day one. On day number two, there's two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree for a grand total of three gifts. All right. On the third day of Christmas, there were three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. So by my count, that's Six. Six items. All right. On the fourth day of Christmas, uh, uh -oh. four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All right. So if you add that all up, 
that was 10 gifts. So each day you're getting not just one extra gift, you're getting a bunch of extra gifts because you're getting all the gifts from the day before plus some new number of gifts. And what we're seeing here is growth that's, yeah, not just linear growth, but it's, it's growing faster. And actually, this is cool, you've seen this sequence before. Let me, let me do just one more. So you've got your five golden rings, the four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. That's 15 items. If you've been watching for a few days, you might have you might recognize this sequence. This was our Minecraft stairway. The, the, the number of blocks that went that belonged in our stairway of each height. So in this case, so on the challenge sheet today, I actually drew something out and I needed to make it a three-dimensional drawing because on, on yeah, you can actually see we have a bunch of Minecraft staircases that stacked up against each other, the 2D staircases, and it's giving us this three-dimensional pyramid. And so the, these numbers here, they actually call the triangular numbers because they had to do that, that staircase pattern. It makes a nice triangle. But now we've jumped to the three-dimensional version. They call these numbers the triangular pyramidal numbers. And what would be nice is if we could come up with a formula for this. Well, <laughs> turns out that's easier said than done. It's, it's not, not quite so easy. Um, so I actually, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you what that formula is. Uh, so on day number N, the number of gifts that are given out is n times n plus 1 times n plus 2, all divided by 6. So let's just test that. So what I'm saying is that on day number 3, we would have had 3 times 4 times 5, all divided by 6. So what is 3 times 4 times 5 is 60, and we divide that by 6, we would get 10. Am I on? Let me try it again. 3 times... Four times five. Have I got the wrong formula? <laughs> Uh-oh. Three times four is indeed 12. 12 times five is 60. 60 divided by six is 10. Am I off by a day? Uh-oh. There goes me trying to be all fancy. What? <laughs> uh, day three. Three times four. Huh. It's okay, math dad. Everyone makes mistakes. Yep. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Well, maybe I'll try to look this up and give you the right formula next time. If I... That's why you should always check your answers, though. Don't, don't, don't just write it down and move on. Plug things in and see if it worked. Okay. So I, have, I do have a couple of interesting questions, though, that are not so difficult. Questions that I, that I do know how to find the answer to. And here are the two questions that I have for you. So the first question is, how many total gifts are in the song? So if you go through all 12 days of Christmas, let's, let me see if I can do this. Uh, 12, 12 drummers drummer, drumming, 11 pipers piping, 10 lords a-leaping, 9 ladies dancing, 8 maids a-milking, 7 swans a-swimming, 6 geese a-laying, 5 golden rings, 4 calling birds, 3 French hens, 2 turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All right, so... On the last day, that was 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. That was a lot of gifts in one day. But I want to know across all 12 days, how many gifts total? So that's my first question for you. How yes. many presents? Yep. How many total presents across the entire sum? All right. Then my secondary question is, out of those 12 items that were gifted, which item or items were given the most of? So for example, the number one, this partridge in a pear tree, it got given away every day, but there was just one of them given every day. So actually only 12 partridges in pear trees were given out as gifts. What, I mean, there were also, I think there were 12 drummers drumming on the very last day, so that the drummer's drumming tied with the partridges in a pear tree. But which item got given away the most? So that's my question for you. You can report back in 
with, with your answer next time. Good luck figuring it out. All right. Awesome job, Math Dad. Thank you. Sure. And before we do what's in the bag, and what's in the bag is a fun little thing. And Math Dad does not, um, he, did ha he did happen to see these, but he hasn't seen the last clue, which kind of gives it away. So we're going to see if he can guess that. But before we do that, I want to take just a minute to, to welcome and to say thank you to our new patrons. This has been the, the amount of growth we've had in the last couple of days has just been incredible. We've had more than 200 people join us on Patreon. And um, I'm going to try to say this without getting like choked up, but it, it's a lot of work to, to do these live streams. And Math Dad still has a full time job and has had meetings all afternoon the last few days. And if it weren't for our patrons, I think we'd be coming up on Friday and we'd be saying, we can't do this anymore. We're just going to have to stop because it's too much work. But because of our patrons, I'm able to look at my science mom, Liza, science mom, Krista, and science mom, Emily, and say, hey, we can pay you guys to work some more hours so that then we can keep doing this. And then we can also look at getting upgrading our equipment because I know a few people, especially today on Facebook, have said that it keeps freezing. We need to get a cable so that we can be plugged into the ethernet instead of going on the Wi-Fi. And like little changes like that now, we are going to be able to do because of you. So to the 200 patrons who have joined us this past day, like I was in, I was almost in tears yesterday, just with gratitude for what you've done. So thank you so much. And um, I, I gotta, indeed, and and all the fun artwork and the, the support and the letters of support. You guys are having fun with this, and, and oh. that that was entirely the goal. So we really appreciate all the submissions. Uh, keep them coming. Post yeah. them to Facebook and. and comment on other people's and this, is a, this has been a fun community project it's been amazing and now i'm going to do the what's in the bag before i because i don't want to cry on live to live live streaming so do have... i do i have been cut but don't bleed i i didn't actually read these so okay i have been cut and i don't bleed so what do you cut well like a vegetable I... wouldn't bleed so you have a vegetable in your pocket it's a carrot i have teeth but don't bite Like scissors cut, but they don't have teeth. Oh man! All right, chat, help, bail me out here. Okay, because okay, what's teeth, but you don't bite, cut, but don't bleed. My master is a skeleton. My master is a skeleton. Oh, oh this, this is go, a good one. This could go a lot of different directions. Just say teeth, but I don't bite. Like. Master is a skeleton lady. I don't have a diamond, but people put me on a ring. I don't have a diamond, but people put me on a ring. Oh dear, oh dear. Could that even be? I'm used to open things. I'm seeing things like a dead body. Paper. Paper. That's what I'm used, so it might be easier if you think of the last last clues. I'm used to open things, although I don't have a diamond. People put me on a ring. Oh boy, I gotta give a shout out to science mom, um, Liza, for coming up with this one, because she came up with this one and it's good. Ooh, someone got it. Another a, person got it. A key? Yes, a key. A teeth on a key. <sighs> yeah, so a key has, this is <laughs> such a good one. A key has teeth. These little knobs here are called the teeth of the key, and it's been cut. It, that you cut keys out of metal and the master key like if you have different keys for every door in a building a skeleton key yes. is the master key yeah oh. the master key that can open up all the doors is called a skeleton key oh my goodness so everyone give claps to science mom liza because she came up with this one and it's outstanding and totally stumped math dad all right liza you got me that too <laughs> nicely done nicely done oh. now we are we are going to share some more of the maze entries, and then we're going to give you the drawing prompt, and then we're going to stick around for a whole more Q and A than we think, usually I think have we time for. We have some for. riddles we were going to give to you. Oh, we do. We have jokes. So let's do. We'll do mazes, jokes, and then our drawing prompt for next time, and then we'll do Q and A. So here is. Let's see. Oh, we did that one already. Yep. Here we are with. This maze, and I loved this one. What is, so she drew lines for the path and each line starts with a letter. And then you have to say, what's the letter for 
for yeah, the right path. Yeah, to tracing along the line. I love, loved some of the non-traditional mazes that, that showed up. Yeah. Those, those can be a lot of fun and definitely more challenging than you'd think. You're like, oh, I just have to follow the line, but you can get lost. You can. And then help the dog find the bone. I thought this one was great and a really cute little dog. And then we did get a submission from a little while ago that that made me and Math Dad laugh pretty hard. <laughs> that is a maze. So this one by Valentina says that there are three paths. One leads to an angry man with a sandal. One leads to 10,000 times gravity and one leads to a zap that will obliterate you. And then she drew pictures of science mom and math dad and math dad looks rather terrified. And you've got to pick the right path to get to the least dangerous door, which is definitely the sandal. I would much rather face a sandal slap than I would 10,000 times gravity or a zap that would obliterate us. So that was an excellent maze. Do, do you know what I liked about that one? What? Uh, math that had hair. <laughs> <laughs> so that one was great. And now I'm going to share a couple jokes with you guys and then we will do, and then we will do Q and A and the next, the next artwork. So here we are. And these ones, I I haven't seen the answers yet, but math does. All right, so how does Darth Vader like his toast? Um, I'm going to say, oh, oh, dark. It's got to be something about dark. On the dark side. On the dark side. Very yeah, yeah. nice. Very good. What do you call a fake noodle? A fake noodle? Um, fake noodle would be what? Um, no, I don't know. In an impasta. An impasta. I like it. An impasta. How does a scientist freshen her breath? Um, with breath mints, but that's not a pun. With experiments. With, with experiments. experiments. <laughs> that's right. All right. How does a cucumber become a pickle? How does a cucumber become a pickle? I am really not sure. How does a cucumber become a pickle? It goes through a jarring experience. Oh, because they get canned in jars. Yeah. That's uh, great. Wait, um, wait did, so how do cucumbers become pickles? Do you know? Yes, yes. You put them in <laughs> brine, salt water. You don't know this? Well, I mean, it's like some magical stuff you put them in and then you leave them for a while. Or? Yes, yes. So okay. you, you put them in a solution of brine, salt water, and then it... Um, changes changes the structure and they get very salty and pickled yep <laughs> nice all right all right drawing prompt and then we will answer questions so tomorrow's drawing prompt ready set draw nope is maze that was yesterday's and then tomorrow's drawing prompt is cats and dogs so there are a lot of different ways you could go with this, cats versus dogs. If you have a, a cat or a dog, you can draw a picture of them. Maybe write a poem about your pet and why your pet is the best. You can you can write about which is better and why, or you could take it to like kind of a fantastic type setting and um, whoops, if you had like, you know, if they each had technology, like who would win in a contest or- If they had a race or yeah, in, in, in a battle, I mean. Yeah. Some cats could beat some dogs. Some dogs might be able to beat some cats. Maybe you want to approach it from a scientific point of view. Maybe you design a tournament bracket. I, I, so it's very, very open-ended. Have fun with it. Cats versus dogs. We can't wait to see what you come up with. And when you finish your drawing, there is a post on the Science Mom Facebook page, Ready, Set, Draw. You can post your pictures there and then enjoy commenting on and seeing other people's artwork. You can also post it to Instagram. And like, like we mentioned, um, when you post it to Instagram, Use the hashtags quarantine and science mom squad, and you can tag me, and then you can see the other artwork that people are posting there as well. And now we'll head over to the chat. Oh, we're already seeing some dogs, people with very strong opinions. Dogs are better, cats are better. <laughs> <laughs> and we will oh. take, um, ooh, we have someone who said the, the formula. Is this for the? Do I need to divide by 10? That would have gotten you six instead of six. Instead that, that, of that would have fixed it, fixed it in that one instance, but I think we've got a problem Oops. there. I don't think it would have worked for other values of n, but I, I like the, the, that correction is you, you're barking up the right tree to try to fix the formula somehow. I'm, I'm really not sure where I messed up. We'll, we'll find out tomorrow. We'll find out tomorrow. So let's, um, let's save the, the cat and dogs 
um, conversation for your your drawings tomorrow, and we'll take some time now. We we it's nine twenty nine, so we have more time for Q and A. So we'll try and answer just as many of your questions as we can. Math and science questions, general questions. So any questions that you have. Ooh, what? This is a great one. What would happen if the gravity was ten thousand times stronger? Um, I would need to actually do a bit of calculations to be able to tell you exactly what would happen. But I think we're talking like black hole level of destruction. Like you'd yeah. be pancaked. Well, well yes, certainly we couldn't survive that. No. Yeah. Human beings black out when they get up to... Is it four, two or three, three or four Gs, I think? Yeah, so I, I think you... it might be like seven or eight. It kind of depends on which direction the forces are applied. That's true. Um, so you can you can handle more gravity if you're laying down on your back than you can if you're standing up. So if you're in a plane and the plane is going super fast and you're starting to experience like additional, they call it Gs. So one G is regular gravity, what we experience. But then if the gravity is twice as strong, that's two Gs. And Air Force pilots, when they're flying planes and they're going so fast, their acceleration is so rapid, they actually experience the equivalent of extra gravity because the force is so high. So um, yeah, it would depend on a couple things, but 10,000 is definitely, that's, that would be game over. That would be game over. You would get squashed. Yeah, so an interesting fact. So if you were in a spaceship, in space, and if that spaceship is accelerating at the negative 32 feet per second squared or negative 9.8 meters per second squared, that would feel just like gravity on Earth. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yeah. So that's one of those nice this physics formulas. Claire asked a great question here. What do we prefer, cats or dogs? And you know what I think? I think we're going to take our own little drawing drawing challenge today. And fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. We will. You will find out tomorrow. We will. We will take this as well, and we'll draw. We'll draw a picture so you can find out. And someone said you wouldn't be answering this because your computer would be crushed if it was ten thousand G's, and that is correct. That is correct. And then any other questions? Oh, does gravel work with the coke? That's a great question. Whoops. Does gravel work with the coke? It would, but not as well as sand because the particles, the pieces are so much bigger. And so you're not going to get as many places where bubbles can form around a piece of gravel as you would around several pieces of sand. But I have tried putting like, I've tried putting lava rocks in because lava rocks have a whole bunch of holes and I've tried gravel before. Sand usually works the best, but gravel would work as well. Another Mentos question, can you use Coke, not Diet Coke? You definitely can. You can try it with any type of soda. The, the, the advantage of using the Diet Coke, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have sugar, right? So it's yes. not going to be sticky. So if you're doing it like on your sidewalk and you do it with regular Coke and then you leave that sugary residue everywhere, it will attract ants and you'll get some ants there. Um, so And it also will be a bit, well, they're both kind of sticky, but the sugary one is stickier. Um. What would happen if the Earth stopped spinning? Ooh, I'm going to have you give a quick answer to that while I go run and grab a book recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if the Earth just abruptly stopped spinning and everything else kept going, well, we have some significant inertia. So it's not like the Earth is spinning super fast; it would fling us off. But if we if we suddenly stopped, what we're we're actually spinning at thousands of miles per hour and that would send up, fling us thousands of miles per hour. Like it, it would not be pretty. We, we, we could not handle. But that. assuming assuming the Earth just suddenly stopped and we stopped with it, um, if the air didn't stop, it would be unbelievable. And that's actually a question in this book, What If, by Randall Monroe. And I've got to tell you guys, if you have not seen the What If book, oh my goodness, such a fantastic book recommendation. I love it. Math Dad loves it. All of our kids love it and have read it. And you can just, I mean, you can read it kind of chapter by chapter. They're interesting questions in there, like what would happen if, and then this crazy situation, and then he answers it with comics usually. And it's so funny and interesting. So I, I would say read the read that question in the what if book because he gives a much better answer and he actually like calculates out exactly what the wind speed would be if the earth stopped spinning all of a sudden, but the wind didn't stop. And it would be like beyond hurricane, every building obliterated. It's it's really kind of a fun answer to read because the science that happens there is just crazy. And I would say that book's probably a sixth grade level. It's 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 not 
not for a first or second grader, unless you read it, read it with them as a parent. They, but it's, the parents will enjoy it. Yeah, it, it's, it's it's fantastic. What would happen if you had, oh, why is there gravity? That is actually a really outstanding question. Why is there gravity? Probably try to answer that on the different levels I mean, yeah, because of so, the curvature of space time. The, the cool thing about gravity, gravity seems pretty simple if you just think about it on the surface, like things fall down, right? But if you think about gravity a little deeper than that, it actually gets pretty weird because gravity is both space and time kind of connected together. And maybe we're, we're designing out future science lessons and maybe we'll try and kind of weave that in and show you visually what gravity is in, in a future lesson, but that's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool concept. Do you own a pet? We do, we have, we have two reptiles. We have a desert tortoise who just barely came out of hibernation and then regretted it very much. She's just been hunched up in a corner asleep ever since because it got warm and then it got much colder. And then we have a, um, Bearded dragon. So those are our pets. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll bring them out and show them at, at, on a future episode. Um, so somebody did ask, how could you submit if you don't have Facebook or Instagram? Ooh. I, mean, I assume you actually have to have an account. Yes, that is a good question. So if you don't have Facebook or Instagram, but you want to submit your drawing, um, there are two ways you can do it. I will tell you, if you email it to me at art at science.mom, my inbox is so full. It might be a little while before I see it, but I will see it eventually and I will respond, but I'm not gonna be able to respond today or tomorrow because my, my inbox is really, really full. So if you don't have Instagram or Facebook, you can do that, you can email it to me, or if you're a patron, you can post it on the community tab in Patreon. Those are two ways that you could share it. Um, but I, the Facebook and Instagram is preferred if you have those, because then it's easier for me to see them and respond. I don't have a Facebook account either. I, or Instagram. I, I just don't want to deal with it. Actually, oh, no, I, I do have, have an Instagram. Instagram, mostly just so I can so you like can, your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I posted a picture once. You did. Yeah, yeah, Math Dad's not on Facebook either. All right. Do you have a favorite scientist? Oh, that's such a hard question. Do I have a favorite scientist? I have lots of favorite scientists. I love Barbara McClintock, who was the first person to discover jumping genes. I really love Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, um, Einstein, Madame Curie. So many, Rosalind Franklin, there are so many scientists that I admire and look up to. Maybe we should do like a, a scientist trivia thing each time. Oh, so we could like share more about famous scientists. Yes, which scientist we're talking yeah. about. Okay, well so, let, let, let me answer that as oh, well. Yes. Uh, math is a science. It's it's the most exact of all the sciences. So I, I think mathematicians should, should count here. They definitely should. As well. Um, so who's your favorite mathematician? Oh man, I'd probably go for Euler, so E-U-L-E-R. But Leonard Euler was just an amazingly prolific mathematician, wrote like 1,700 papers throughout the course of his life. And even when he went blind, he was still writing. So kind of like Beethoven writing symphonies after he'd gone deaf. Like it's really impressive. Someone asked why should we, we should try and switch subjects. That might be kind of fun. Maybe we should have a next, next Wednesday, Wacky Wednesday, we should have you do the science demo, I'll do the math lesson. <laughs> we'll, we'll think about that. We'll, we'll think, think about, about that. that. <laughs> um, somebody asked, what would happen if you went to the middle of the earth? What would happen if you went to the middle of the earth? Um, should we assume that you're in some type of like crazy sci-fi submersible that will withstand the pressure? Um, that or um, so the, there's that Jules Verne book, Journey to the Center of the yeah. Earth. And in that case, they find this cave system and they're actually able to make their way down towards the center of the earth. Uh, of course, in that book, they end up discovering dinosaurs these, living down there, and like yeah, well, these giants that, yeah. that are down there. This whole other civilization, as well as this ocean underneath. Um, yeah, so the, we've learned a little bit more since that point in time. But uh, yeah, the the problem with traveling to the center of the Earth would be the oh, the, the heat, the temperature, and the, and the, and the density, the pressure. So as, as you leave the crust and start going down through, you get lava, and then you get hotter lava and thicker lava and hotter and thicker lava, and then at the center, we have an iron nickel core. So solid iron and solid nickel together. And that core I, is so is so hard. I, you wouldn't be able to actually go into that with any type of machine that we have now, but assuming you could, it would be very dark, it would be very hot, and there would be a lot of pressure. Good question. Yeah, the glowing hot lava might. 
Yeah, be, lots and lots of love it. putting off color, so I'm it seeing, be dark. I'm seeing a lot of people asking, did Math Dad have hair? We'll have to show a picture next time to as proof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good old days. Oh, here's a great question. Um, oh, and then it went so fast, it was gone. But did, does oxygen only exist on Earth? No, oxygen exists in other planets as well. In most planets in our solar system, you can find a wide variety of elements, but certain planets have more than others. So if you go to the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, you're gonna find a lot more oxygen there, but a lot of it will be in liquid form. It'll be because it's so cold. And those, those planets are a lot colder than Earth. Great question. Ooh, and we have some requests. Can you do a lesson on negative numbers? That's what my seventh grader is currently working on. Okay. We, we could I, work, I that can work on that. Yeah. I, I will say when I, the dry ice bubble that we did our first time, I like to do predictions about when it will pop. And I'll say, I think it'll pop in 10 seconds. Let's count down. And so we'll count down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then when we get to zero and it doesn't pop, I look surprised. And then we just keep going zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. So no, negative numbers are pretty cool. Indeed. All right. Um, somebody, oh. somebody had asked whether you could use strawberries. We'll, we'll get to that oh, one in just okay. a minute. But how many weeks are we doing quarantine for? Thanks to the support of our wonderful patrons, we will be doing quarantine for as long as school is closed. Now that so, schools might open up in different places at different times. Well, we'll, so, we'll so kind of adjust just based on, on interest and how many people are watching. But at least four weeks, because I know for sure where we live in the state of Nevada, school will be closed for four weeks. So Monday through Friday. For the next four weeks, you can find us here. Awesome. Strawberries and the Coke. What would strawberry? Because the strawberries have little bumps on them, right? They do. Um, my, my guess is, though, that on the microscopic level, like where a lot of those reactions are taking place, they're actually I, not really yeah, that bumpy. I don't think that strawberries would work. I think that strawberries are too smooth. And... Ooh, this is another great question. What would happen if everyone jumped at once? That is actually a question in the What If book. And the answer is super fantastic. So um, in the What If book, the short, the short summary is if everyone jumped at once, nothing would happen. But then if everyone in the earth was in the same place, the next like two months while people tried to travel out of that same place would be catastrophic. So it would be a bad idea. That's right. We, we just don't weigh enough compared to the earth. All the, all the people on the earth are super tiny compared to the mass of the entire earth. Oh, I keep trying to, <laughs> um, I, someone said that they really want us to answer our question. I will say there are so much, there are so many things about dogs and cats in the chat that I'm having a hard time even reading the questions as they go by. They're going by so, so fast. Someone asked how many seeds can you eat without being sick? Who invented strawberries? Um, you could eat, yeah, a cup, a cup worth of apple seeds would probably be fatal, have enough cyanide to be fatal. And I mean, that would be, you'd have to get seeds from maybe 50 apples to fill up a whole entire cup. More. But if you eat just one apple, you don't need to worry about getting sick. If you eat one apple and all the seeds, that's not enough cyanide to, to cause any damage. And then who invented strawberries? Strawberries are a really cool fruit. Um, they're, they're a droop and wild strawberries are actually really small, but there are a couple berries that are similar that have um, that have their seeds just sort of all mixed up within. All right, so question here, can you use Tic Tacs? Ooh, good question. Tic Tacs would be very similar in the Mentos experiment to um, jelly beans. So you're not gonna see a very big eruption because they're so thin. You don't think they would have the same surface? I, I, mean, I, I would think they were kind of like Mentos. Kind of like Mentos. I have never tried them. If somebody tries this, let, let us know the answer. Yeah, I've never tried them, but my, my guess is that they wouldn't be like Mentos because I'm guessing if they were, that that already would have become a thing if yeah. you could well, see online. And, and my my problem with this was I looked at Mentos and like those are so smooth they can't possibly be rough and that that can't cause the reaction. There's lots of candies that are rougher than Mentos, but it, it's down at a microscopic level where yeah. the roughness is taking place. So you, you can't really see it, which which makes it hard to speculate about which other candies have a similar roughness to them. Amanda asks, is the What If book sponsoring us? It is definitely not. We have no sponsors. So all our recommendations are 100% from us, not because right. we're getting played. Is there dry ice on other planets? There is. There are other planets that have temperatures way colder than Earth and pressure higher than Earth as well, where you would actually see frozen carbon dioxide naturally. 
We, we did oh, have- Oh, I'm seeing, all right. Can you make static underwater? Can you make static underwater? I do not believe you will be able to get any sort of static charge buildup underwater because any extra electrons are just going to travel out because water is such a good conductor of electricity. Good yeah. question. Maybe if it was pure water, that would be a harder question because the pure water without any ions in it wasn't a good conductor, right? Yeah, correct. I was, I was going to mention that so there's a, a local company that called Socrates that has online math lessons and other other science lessons. And, and you know, dur dur during this, uh, for, for the next 90 days or so, if I remember right, they're, they're letting parents have to sign their kids up for free. There are a lot of um, a lot of resources. Maybe we should try and kind of compile a list because there are a lot of great, great learning resources right now. Yeah. But yeah, that one, that one's a good one. Um, ooh, why do you need a space suit in space? This is a great question. I'll tell you why you need a space suit in space. It's because space is a vacuum, a vacuum of nothingness. So we sometimes will look at air, like the air that's in this room right now, and if there's no other stuff in the room, we'll say, oh, the room's empty. But the truth is, on Earth, there is no such thing as an empty room because the room is going to be full of air. And air is something. Air is oxygen and nitrogen and argon and really small trace amounts of carbon dioxide and other gases. And air has weight and it has substance. And that's what we live in. Just like fish live in water, we live in air. And if you go to outer space and then you are outside of air, you don't have air around you anymore, that's kind of like taking a fish out of water. Really bad things happen really fast and it's not, not pleasant. So you need a spacesuit in space because we have to live in air. That's obviously what we need to breathe, but it's also what we need just to be alive. And if you went to outer space without a spacesuit, um, if you take a cup of water into space and that cup of water is not in a spacesuit, all of the water would instantly turn into a gas because there's no, there's no pressure to keep it liquid. So space is a very hostile, dangerous place. And, ooh. Sorry, these questions are coming up so so fast. I'm having a hard time keeping up. How long have you been a scientist? I want to be an engineer. Awesome. I feel like, and I talked about this a little bit um, yesterday, but I feel like I've been a scientist ever since I was a kid because science is really about how you think and how you approach the world about problem solving. I did go to school and um, I'm, I got my degree in crop science and then in molecular biology and studied, but I feel like I've been doing science for longer than that because when I was a kid, I loved doing experiments. This question was- Well, I, I would also say an engineer is a type of scientist. I mean, it so, is. I mean they're an applied physicist. So yeah, if, if engineering is your jam, by all means, pursue that. Yeah, engineering is great. What are atoms made of? They're made of protons and neutrons and electrons. And then in turn, electrons are actually, and protons and neutrons, they're made of these really strange subatomic particles, pairings of subatomic particles. When you get to the question of what is stuff made of, it's actually a super interesting question. Is air made of atoms? It definitely is. Oh, this one's a great question. Why is there no sound in space? Whoops, and it moved so fast I had a hard time. I don't know how to pause the chat. Uh, I know the answer to this one. All right, it's take it away. Because sound is caused by sound waves. So this wave is actually traveling through a medium. So it's usually traveling through air. And in space, there's no air for the sound wave to actually travel through. And it, it, sound will travel at different speeds through different objects. So for mm -hmm. example, sound will actually travel faster through like a metal bar than it will through the air. And it's all because it, yeah, it's a wave traveling through something in, in space. There's no sound to travel through. And thanks to, um, thanks to one of our fantastic patrons, I want to give a shout out to Songbay. We actually have a vacuum chamber that is on the way. And when our vacuum chamber gets here, we're definitely going to show you guys and do some cool experience, experiments with a vacuum. And one of those that we can do is putting a buzzer in the vacuum chamber and you'll hear it ringing. And then when we take all the air out, the buzzer, you know, can no longer hear it, which is really cool. Does the flavor of the Mentos make a difference? Someone knows a hundred digits of pi. That's awesome. Does the flavor of the Mentos make a difference? It should not make a big difference, but from the experimenting that we have done over the past few years, 
I think the mint ones seem to work a little bit better. The fruity ones don't seem to work as well, but that might be just because our kids like the fruity ones better and they get eaten so fast, we haven't been able to use them as much. Yeah, so. our, our sample size is pretty small there. <laughs> it I, is. I suspect the surfaces have to be quite similar. Will Sprite work? Other types of soda will definitely work. Um, I'm gonna look real quick, because I know Science Mom Krista is in the chat too, and she's sending us a few um, she, messages. So the, the question was, how does glow in the dark work? What, what, what's causing Ooh. things to glow in the dark? That is a great question. So glow in the dark works in a couple different ways depending on what, what is glowing. But one of the coolest ways in my opinion is luminescence, bioluminescence. And bioluminescence works. Basically you have this molecule that stores energy by, by part of the molecule moving. And then when it moves, it gives off, it gives off light. Bioluminescence is really, really cool. And maybe we can go into a more detailed um, lesson on that later on. I'm gonna going to kind of make a note and add it to a list. Okay, here's a question, and I don't know the answer to this. But what does pH stand for? We're talking about the, the pH of something is, is, is the scale of how acidic or basic something is. And do you know what it stands for? I actually don't know off right. the top of my head. Yeah, I, would have to, I was sleeping through my chemistry class. I would have to Google uh, that. While science mom was writing to find on my out. Um, I mean, does it have to do with hydrogen atom? No, so, so pH is actually on the acidic side, you have more hydrogen atoms. On the opposite of acidic, you have more hydroxide um, molecules. So that's an oxygen and a hydrogen together. So it could have something to do with like a measure of hydrogen. I wouldn't be surprised if that was it, but I would have to Google that. I don't know off the top of my head. How many galaxies are there? It's Ooh. billions. Lots. Yeah. Lots. We can through telescopes we can see galaxies, other galaxies out there, but they look they look like stars to us with if you're looking with the naked eye because they're so far away. Um, and through a telescope you can see that there are actually other galaxies galaxies and there are a lot. Billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars. It's it's amazing. You start thinking about these numbers and you realize, wow, the universe is a big place. It is, it is. And I'm seeing several people are asking, how did the Big Bang start? There are some interesting theories about that. But the funny thing is, with some of the stuff like that, it can be really tricky to find out because no one was around to observe it back then. But there are some cool theories. And the neat thing about the universe is that it's expanding still. So there, yeah, there's sp space, space and time. When you start getting into the, the physics of space and time, there's some crazy fun stuff there. Oh, and we have an answer. pH equals potential hydrogen. Thank you. Can we live on Mars? I think we could live on Mars, but I have to say, the more you look at living on more Mars, the more you appreciate how nice it is to live on Earth. Because on Earth, you can walk outside and stay alive. On Mars, if you had a little habitation, a little building on Mars, and you walked outside, that would be fatal. You would die because the atmosphere is so thin, and because it doesn't have the right gases that we need, and so I, we could live on Mars with a lot of technology, with you know these structures that we would build to live in. It's possible, but it would be difficult. Do you want to add yeah, anything that, to that? Oh, just that, yeah, that that would be be pretty pretty crazy. I, I mean, I didn't realize there was even any atmosphere. But yeah, I, I think a lot of the, there'd be radiation problems, right? There, yeah, there would yeah. be. Yeah, the atmosphere protects us. There are a lot of problems there. Does math dad like science? Does science mom like math? That's a great question. I do like math, although I will say I don't know nearly as much math as math dad because he got a PhD in math and he has had many more math classes than I have had. And because he teaches math, he gets a lot more practice doing math. So when it comes to simple math problems and calculations, he's much better at it than I am. But I feel like math and science go hand in hand. And math really is the key to science. The more math you have, the more science you can do. But I do like math, and math dad does I, like science. I like science a lot. I, I often let science mom do the sciencey stuff around the house because she's she's better at it. So it's one of those married coupled things where yeah, we make a good we kind make of a specialize good in our own region. But yeah, absolutely, I love science. We, um, what planet would be the best planet to live on? Definitely Earth. Definitely Earth. And outside of Earth. I would say, you know, Mars has, <laughs> outside of Earth, oh boy. Our, our solar system doesn't have a lot of good options. <laughs> <laughs> no. So there really is no planet B. 
Um, Earth is amazing in terms of the temperature being nice and consistent, having plenty of water, and having air we can breathe. Those are all really important things, and Earth has those three things. When you go to Mars, the temperature is really cold, the air we cannot breathe, and there's only a little bit of water, so that those are big challenges. If you go to Europa, one of the moons around Jupiter, there is a lot of water, but it's even colder and there's essentially no atmosphere. So we would have to live underneath like a, a layer of ice that's about two miles thick. That would be very dark, very cold, very wet and, and difficult. And then the next nearest planet that we know of that we think could be habitable, could have a, you know, a planet that we could live on, it's in Alpha Centauri and it would take generations to yeah, get like there. Four light years, it takes light four years to travel. It's super, super yeah. far away. So that's a that's a great, great question. Oh, and someone mentioned Titan. Titan would be a very difficult place to live as well. Um, how is dry ice made? Whoops. How is dry ice made? That's a great question. And I'm having a hard time clicking off because the chat is going so fast. Dry ice is often is made in a couple different ways. Basically, you need to have a source of carbon dioxide. Usually you get that by, by burning a fuel. And then you need to have a way to super cool it and compress it down. There are a couple different ways that you can make that. And um, one, of our, one of our listeners the, um, after the first lesson told me about the industrial way they make dry ice. And it was actually pretty cool. So I would say if you want a little research project, kind of look that up online after our video is done, you'll find some cool so they, answers. So they, I think they, they put a lot of pressure on it until it actually did turn liquid? Yeah, they turned it liquid first and then they released the pressure. And then as a, half of it evaporated, it took heat from the liquid and that cooled the liquid into ice, which I thought was kind of crazy and cool. If you were to pour oil all over a lake and burn it, would you get smoke and steam at the same time? This is a great question. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. Anytime that you are burning something, you are producing smoke and the main ingredients of smoke are both water and carbon dioxide, both. So anytime you have combustion, like you know the car exhaust coming out of the, uh, you know, the a car. Just a candle? Even just a candle, you are gonna get both water and carbon dioxide. Anytime that you burn a hydrocarbon, you know, whether that's wax or gasoline or petroleum, you get both things being produced. So you don't need a lake. You don't yeah. need a lake, but um, with and with and this is why forest fires sometimes when forest fires are really big, they will produce clouds that are so large that then those clouds will form their own thunderstorms and can start new new fires. And you wouldn't be getting clouds from a forest fire unless that forest fire was actually producing water vapor, which it does. So good question. Can sound travel through water? It definitely can. Sound can travel through water, and that's why um, whales do whale songs and use um, sound to communicate over huge distances because sound actually travels a little bit easier, better through water than it does through air. What would happen if there was no moon? This is a great question. Life on earth would be so different if there was not a moon. We would not have tides where you know the ocean waves go up and then go down. And that would really affect how nutrients circulate in the oceans and might really change the whole ecology of the planet. But also, Probably if we didn't have a moon, our planet would not be on a tilt. There would be no seasons either. So those two things would have huge, huge impacts. I had no idea that the tilt had been caused by the moon or was affected because they're, they're That's what I remember learning. Although to be honest, I would that's something that I would want to double check. Right. Um, so because I know that there are other planets in our solar system that have plenty of tilt and no moons. So this is true. Uh, aha, I'm calling your bluff. All right, we'll have to research it and yeah, and we'll see. We'll question. see. That's what I remember learning. Um, seeing someone say Pluto is not a planet, it all mm. happens on how you define a planet. So, okay, what are light years? Ooh, what are light years? Light years is how long it takes light to travel. Uh, no, no, you said it wrong. <laughs> light, a light me. year is the distance that light will travel in one year. There we go. So, so a light year is not a time, it's a distance. And it's huge, because you know how fast light can travel. Light speed is the fastest thing there can be. So. A light year is a really long distance. It's it, it, super, it, it's super long. further than we've ever had a spaceship be, be able to travel. Yeah, it is. It is very, very far. These questions are just fantastic. There's, there's, they're flying so fast. There's no way that we can answer them all. But thank you. We're getting close to ten o'clock, so I want to get ready to wrap up and close and just say thank you for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed 
this, this time with us. And I can't wait to see the marble mazes or marble drops and the cat versus dog drawings that you guys come up with. I'm, I'm curious whether the cats or the dogs will be the favorite. And it's okay to have both too. I will say for animal lovers out there who have both cats and dogs and love them both, some people have very strong opinions about one being better than the other. But if you're an animal lover and you think both are wonderful, you can definitely do a drawing with cats and dogs living in harmony and say that they're both great. That's that's completely valid too. Um, as, as we close here, I just want to take a minute and say thank you for joining us. This, this time of everyone being isolated, I know it was kind of challenging. And you are part of a human family, and we are so grateful and glad to have you join us for this daily hour of quarantine where we do fun activities and talk about learning and science. And we will see you again tomorrow. Take care.